What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video. And in this video, I'm going to be building an awesome $1,500 gaming PC build for 2021 and 2022. I'll be building inside of one of this year's most popular PC cases with an awesome theme across the entire build. Not only this, I'll be running you through all the components I selected for the system and why today, putting it together from start right through to finish before booting it up and seeing how it performs in some of my favourite titles and in some of your guys' favourite titles as well. Let's dive into it though after a quick ad from today's video sponsor. The brand new Seagate Firecuda 530 is a super fast Gen 4 NVMe drive that provides incredible speeds, life-lasting endurance and support for PlayStation 5. With both read and write speeds in the region of 7 gigabytes a second, this drive delivers incredible speeds with huge capacities available. Let's kick things off by taking a look at the case. The Thermaltake Tower 100 has a really unique aesthetic that's taken the case market by storm in all honesty uh, this year. This is a limited edition racing green version they've just brought out that looks awesome. It's a theme we're going to try and continue around the entire system today, including this really, really snazzy racing green tough ram that's actually going to perfectly match the colorway of the case. With plenty of glass and a really unique form factor, it's going to make for a build that's just that little bit special. It's also got a really unique form factor, as you can probably tell from the size of the box, and actually stands up vertically. I've just seen my first glimpse of the green, and I'm not going to lie, it looks insane. Now, I know the big trend nowadays is to spray paint your PC case, and I'm sure it's something we'll be doing soon on the channel. But if you can get it from the factory with an awesome powder coat green finish, then I mean, why the hell not? Let's just pop this on the table, take off the plastic sleeve. Wow, that looks awesome. So we've got tempered glass on the front and on both the sides, but still plenty of ventilation. We've got vents at the top, vents on the right-hand side, vents on the left-hand side, vents on the bottom, more vents on the bottom, basically ventilation. Oh, at the back as well, vents everywhere, which should help keep the system today as cool as possible. I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but let's actually start off by removing as many of the case's side panels as possible, and then just store them safely inside your case's included box. This will make sure you don't drop them, smash them, break them, scratch them, or anything like that, which could ruin uh, your build. So let's get all of those off, and then we can move on and look at the motherboard and the processor. I appreciate what I've just done is made the case look a lot like a skeleton, but it does clear up room to mount the motherboard on these four standoffs, which we'll cover in more detail in just a moment. For the motherboard, I've gone for MSI's B550i Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. Now, this board basically has all the key features and functionality that we need for a system like this. It's got Gen 4. NVMe SSD support, room for two RAM DIMMs, support for the latest Ryzen 5000 processors out of the box, and Wi-Fi on board. You get a little bit of overclocking headroom, not loads, but that's not really the point with a motherboard like this, in a small form factor system at least. For the processor then, first I've gone for AMD's Ryzen 5 5600X. With six cores, 12 threads, and some great multi-threaded and single-threaded performance, you know it's going to be a great option for the system. It is more expensive than some of Intel's current 11th gen i5s, but that's for a reason. It's a better processor. As a general rule of thumb, you can run up to an RTX 3070 on this chip without really any bottlenecking, and even some titles on an RTX 3080. The CPU though is just one part of the equation. To really complete our sum, we need to go for some good memory, and that's where Thermal Takes Tough Ram Racing Green Edition comes in. This is obviously perfectly designed to match up with the case. There are mixed feelings on this colorway. Jake in the office is not a fan, but I personally think it looks really, really awesome. You can get this memory in a black instead, much like you can get the case in a black too, but this match is actually a really, really nice touch and just gives the build a little bit of something different, which I think is what you want uh, when you're spending a bit extra money on a nicer chassis, an ITX motherboard, and Gen 4 storage, which we'll move on to later. Pull back the dims on your RAM dim slots, and then simply slide the memory into place. A bit of pressure to each side, and this nice quick 3600 megahertz kit is going to be installed. Now, one thing we are definitely going to get right in this system is the storage. I've actually gone for Seagate's Firecuda 530, a big shout out to Seagate who actually were kind enough to make today's video possible. This drive is one of their latest Gen 4 options and it might just be the fastest consumer Gen 4 drive 
on the market. Read and write speeds are both in the region of seven gigabytes a second. The write number is the really crucial one that other brands just can't quite hit, which makes this drive an awesome proposition. They do have some slightly cheaper Gen 4 options, like the Fire Cuda 520 available. And this drive, personally, I'd go for a one terabyte option to really fit in the budget today, as opposed to two terabytes. But plenty of options, and we'll link them down at eBuyer and Amazon in the description below. Now also seems like a good time to install the cooler before going ahead and moving the motherboard into the case. Now, to be clear, a liquid cooler at 120mm would work really well for today's build, but an air cooler is perhaps the more budget option that just allows you to get a little bit more in the price to performance department. This Thermaltake Tough Air 310 is nice and cheap, but does a good job for the system today, and is fairly easily installed. By popping these four posts through the included plastic backplate, which will then in turn go through the rear of the motherboard. Drop on these plastic spacers, add into place this then silver thermal tape metal support bracket, and then fasten on these thumb screws. Once you've done this, you put a frame into place that you can screw the cooler onto. Remember of course though, to pop on some thermal paste before you do this to create that nice thermal bond well, that was rude, and I appear to have lost one to create that nice thermal bond between the processor and the cooler itself. You know what? That's looking pretty good and moves us nicely on to the next component today, the graphics card. Now, I know that this is the most controversial component in any build at the moment, but I've heard some of my US fans are having a bit more luck in new egg lotteries and pre-order lists, and at least here in the UK, if you're prepared to pay a little bit over MSRP, we are seeing some stock uh, at retailers within the UK sales channel. Now, obviously, there's no quick fix to the GPU crisis, and we'll be making a detailed video discussing this more a little bit later. Hopefully, changes to the way that Ethereum is mined on around the 10th of December, and increasing supply from semiconductor firms over in Taiwan should help to ease things a little bit. But unfortunately, I think the GPU crisis is not going away anytime particularly soon. That's even more of a shame considering how good cards like the RTX 3060 Ti are. This is a superb GPU for gaming at 1080 and 1440p, maxing out those settings and still getting 60, 100, 150 frames a second depending on the title. Detailed gaming benchmarks are coming up later though, so hang tight and don't go anywhere. But for now, we're gonna go ahead and install the graphics card itself. This case has got a really cool design as far as GPUs go. You simply slot it in the side where you've got glass and ventilation to keep it nice and cool, giving you a really, really nice aesthetic centerpiece of the build while also retaining all of that really, really good airflow. In order to install our card today, we just need to remove a couple of the PCIe lane covers at the top of the case, which will get you a nice snazzy B-roll shot of before sliding the GPU in itself and clicking it into place. The GPU is looking good and we can wire this up in a moment, but I just wanted to go ahead and see what it looked like with those panels on. And I've got to say, I'm so excited to power the build up for the first time. Before we do that though, we do need to pop in the power supply. This is another component from Thermaltake. They very kindly lent this one out uh, and it's an awesome choice for the system today. Now they have sent out an SFX unit, which is a small form factor power supply but the case doesn't need one, so I'll link one of their ATX options below. Go for a 650 watt unit or above, and that's gonna be the perfect option for the system. Once you've done that, go ahead and get everything wired up uh, with all your cables and wiring and tidy up uh, those cables with a little bit of cable management. Once you've done this, we can boot the system up for the first time and see how it looks. And on the GeekerWatt channel, there's only one thing that can mean, an awesome glam montage of this system in action. I'll see you in a sec for the gaming benchmarks, but first, roll! that montage. <laughs> I've got to say that montage was sick and I am loving the green lighting we've gone for to kind of fit in with the colour scheme today. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Montage aside though, it's now time to take a look at the performance of this system. We've tested a wide variety of games and the summary of our findings will be on your screen now. As usual, if you're new to the channel, uh, we will be jumping through game by game in a bit more detail in a second. But this summary view is always a really nice one just to give yourself a nice gauge of the performance you could expect if you built this system for yourself. GTA 5 is the first of the games on our focus titles though. Here at 1080p high settings tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, we got 136 FPS on average. That's basically on 
the cap at a frame rate. GTA 5 can't really go above 140, 150 FPS, at least at 1080p on the latest cards. Once you go beyond that point, you start to get quite buggy and quite laggy in areas. So this was a pretty good result for GTA 5. It was a similarly positive story in Watch Dogs Legion. Here we tested at 1440p high with both ray tracing and DLSS enabled. This gave us 82 frames a second, which was around 25 FPS lower than with ray tracing disabled, but still a very solid result. Super playable gameplay, it looked visually fantastic as well, so it's a win-win all around. The MSI RTX 3060 Ti, that's a mouthful, also impressed in our next title, Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War. 1440p high settings with DLSS enabled gave us 160 frames a second on average. But what if you're a player of Apex Legends, the title that's next up today, can you expect the same kind of frame rates as we saw in Cold War? Well, the short answer, sort of. Uh, here we got 121 frames a second on average at 1440p high settings with 90 and 99th percentile results of 97 and 86, showing that the game basically never went below that 86 FPS mark, giving consistent frame rates across the board. Moving on to Valorant, here at 1440p high settings, we got 410 frames a second, just casually over 400 FPS uh, in one of the latest AAA titles. I know Valorant is a much easier title to run as well, in the grand scheme of things, but it's still an impressive thing to see. 400 frames a second on average is insane. Moving on to Cyberpunk next up then, here we tested at 1440p high, but this time with no DLSS. In our previous videos, we managed to achieve around 100 frames a second with DLSS enabled, and I was interested to see what would happen if we turned it off. Well, in short, the frame rate dropped, but we still got 74 frames a second on average providing a playable gaming experience in one of the hardest to run games that the PC gaming market has ever seen. Moving on to Fortnite then, the last game on the list today, and here at 1080p competitive, so with everything tuned down to low, but the render distance set to far, we got 252 frames a second. A pretty impressive showing, all told, and Fortnite, as you'd expect, looked fantastic. That pretty much wraps it up though for today's video. If you did enjoy it, give it a big old like rating, get subscribed if you'd like to see more from me and the team here on the Geeky Watch channel. Thanks for tuning in though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.